All right, population ecology, and we're going to talk about human population, and this is going to be our last video for this chapter. Um, in the last few centuries, the human population has grown at an unprecedented rate. Um, in 1650, we had 50 million people, and it doubled within two centuries, and then again by 1930, and again in 65 years later, and again, and again, and again. And the current population grows um, more than by more than 200,000 people each day. That's like adding another Amarillo every day. And it takes about four years to add the equivalent of another um, United States to the world population. And the estimates on where we'll end up by 2050... Is somewhere between 7.8 and 10.8 billion people. Now, there's lots of variation in, in what people predict, but that's kind of the average of what's predicted. Um, <clears throat> the rate of growth didn't begin to slow down till <clears throat> the 1960s. Um, some of the reasons for for our decline and growth could be um, diseases, including AIDS, and voluntary population control, meaning mainly birth control. Um, a unique fe feature to the human population is that um, we have a, our ability to control family planning and voluntary contraception. Um, social change and um, more women going to college, being educated, and, and having careers delays marriage and, and reproduction for a lot of, of women. Regional patterns and, of population change to have zero growth. You either have to have high birth rate and then high death rate or low birth rate and low death rate. It's the only way to get zero. Um... Demographic transitions associated with increase in, in populations um, are increase with quality of health care, increase of sanitation, and, and improved access to education, especially for women like we talked about before. In the 1970s, the Chinese birth rate was predicted at an average of 5.9 children per woman. Per woman, per lifetime. Um, by 2009, that was decreased to 1.8, largely because of the government's strict one-child policy. Age structure. Age structure is shown as a pyramid. If you look here at the age structure... Uh-oh, sorry. Age structure pyramids here. Um, you can see some variation. If you look at the U.S., let's see, United States is, well, this will work better, is here. You can see it's pretty much even throughout here, other than this bulge you have um, kind of around baby boomer types. Even though that should be a little higher, it seems. I guess it depends on which year this was born. Um, this, what year it was born. What year it was made. But you'll have a bulge for the baby boomers, and then those baby boomers' kids are are at reproductive ages now. Um, so this is going to be kind of a um, continued, um, a stable population. This... 
population should be increasing because you have more and more that are at reproductive ages. And when you see this narrowing on the bottom, that usually is going to show a decrease in um, overall population. Um, infant mortality and life expectancy. Um, infant mortality is the number of deaths per thousand live births. And life expectancy at birth is the predicted average length of life at birth. Um, these vary widely among different human populations. If infant mortality is high, then parents are likely to have more children to ensure that some reach adulthood. Um, for example, infant mortality rate was 155 or 15.5% in Afghanistan, but only 3 or 0.3% in Japan, while life expectancy at birth was 44 years in Afghanistan, 82 in Japan. So it's um, a reverse or uh, inverse relationship there. <sighs> One more slide. All right, we can do this. Estimates. We talked about um, the first estimate, the first known estimate was by Leeuwenhoek. The first guy to see um, critters under a microscope, right? Um, and he had 13.4 billion people. He made that estimation in 1679. Um, other estimate, estimates have varied from less than a billion to a, a trillion with an average of 10 to 15 billion. The carrying capacity um of earth for humans is very difficult to estimate. Um, a lot of people use the amount of habitable land versus how much land you use. Some people use food um, as, as their estimation um, basis. But we, as humans, have multiple constraints. We need food, water, fuel, building materials, and resources such as clothing, transportation. There's something called your ecological footprint and this is how much uh, land and water area are required by each person city or nation to produce all the resources it consumes and absorb all the waste it generates and on average um, or if you if you do the total human population it should come out to about 2 hectares per person, which is about 2.47. If you want to leave room for parks and conservation, that means you need to be at 1.7 hectares per person. And, and Not yet, baby. And um, the U.S., typical person in the U.S. is about 10 hectares. Um, the typical person in the U.S., Canada, or Norway consumes 30 times the amount of energy from as someone in Africa. Um, there is no way to figure out the actual carrying capacity, the ultimate carrying capacity. We can, we can speculate and we can see what factors may eventually limit our growth. I said no. Hey, thank you. Um, uh, food may be problematic because we have lots of malnutrition and famine in some regions. We have unequal distribution of food, not really um, an adequate amount of food, but unequal distribution. And um, we have, we may be limited by suitable space for agricultural land. A lot of that is being developed by housing, but there seems to be few limits um, on how close humans can live together. But you still need to have um, food and water and space um, to dispose of waste. Non-renewable resources such as metals and fossil fuels may be issues, as is fresh water. You're also limited by the capacity of the environment to absorb its waste. Technology um, has increased our carrying capacity but no population can continue to grow indefinitely. So, 
who who knows that's what your book has to say about it anyway guess what thank goodness we're done